Produced by PI Media. Some people within the industry knew someone working on the show Raising Dion. You know, their advice to people working on the show was, you're never going to find an eight-year-old girl in a wheelchair who's funny. They don't exist. You need to get an 11 or 12-year-old girl and have them fake being in a wheelchair. Because you're... Saying that eight-year-olds mm-hmm. can't be funny and that people who have disabilities can't be funny. And that's very wrong. All Inclusive, a podcast on inclusion, innovation, and social justice with Jay Ruderman. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and this is All Inclusive, a podcast focused on inclusion, innovation, and social justice. When the producers of Raising Dion, a Netflix TV series, were looking for an actress to play the role of Esperanza, the main character's best friend, they auditioned many young aspiring actresses. But when they saw Sammy Haney's audition video, they immediately knew they had found what they were looking for. Indeed, Sammy's sassy and confident Esperanza quickly became one of the show's most loved characters. Some critics even called her a show stealer. Sammy, who's only 10 years old, is also a great example of authentic representation of people with disabilities in the entertainment industry. She's here with us today, together with her father, Matt Haney. Sammy and Matt, welcome to All Inclusive. All right, so Sammy, uh, let's get to know you a little bit better. And in specific, can you talk a little bit about your disability? Hi, I'm Sammy Haney. I have osteogenesis imperfecta, type 3, severe. That means I can break very easily. And can you give us an example of, of how that's impacted your life in terms of, you know, how do you go about everyday life with having this disability? Well, there are different types of breaks. One is mild, which it doesn't hurt that much. Two is severe, like it hurts a lot. Well, give them some examples of okay, yeah. how you've broken of, bones. Some of the examples are when I was much younger, I used to break my legs while sleeping by just moving. And then this happens through my life. It never stopped. Whenever I sneeze, I break either a rib or some part of my back. That's why I try not to sneeze. And um, recently, I just broke this arm, but it's healed now. I broke it by just playing a VR video game on my dad's phone. Mm -hmm. And then this arm, it's healed now. It was broken by just trying to get up in the morning. I was trying to sit up, and I put too much pressure on And how does that impact your everyday life, you know, playing with friends or schooling or, or even, you know, being an actress on a television show? When I meet someone new, I have to tell them I break easily so that they know to be careful. And I'm homeschooled because going to school would not really help because – it would danger me, and I have a lot of appointments for doctors and stuff like that, and I would miss a lot of school days. So, Matt, when did you first learn about Sammy's um, condition, and, and what impact did that have on, on your family? Uh, we learned about it while she was still in the womb. The doctor had done a sonogram and seen that her femurs uh, her femur bones were uh, way shorter than expected for the time she was in the womb. And so they did a uh, level two ultrasound. And uh, at first, everything appeared okay. But then they did another one, a follow up, and they found a number of fractures. And so they immediately thought, well, this looks like it might be osteogenesis imperfecta because she has so many fractures. Uh, and with her uh, femurs being shortened as well. And so the, we went through a roller coaster of a number of different possible 
um, conditions she could have, but they ended up uh, after the end of it, realizing it was osteogenesis imperfecta type three. So we knew that before birth. And then, so she had a C-section and at the time of the C-section, she had 19 different fractures, like at, at various stages of healing. Um, and so that was uh, kind of how we found out was just through the sonogram. So we knew before she was born, which helped us kind of prepare and get involved with like Facebook groups and different things where you have other people who've already gone through what we're going through. And so that was uh, very helpful. Uh, as far as oh, helping, uh, how did it impact the family? It really um, opened our eyes to a lot of the ableism that's in society. Just trying to, to go somewhere is really hard when you have a child that has to use a wheelchair because you never know how accessible the place you're going to is. You have to do a lot of research or you have to do like a trip before you go just to see how we're going to get her in there. How are we going to get her out of there? It just makes going places not as easy. You can't, we can't just pack up and go somewhere without knowing, you know, what the location is going to be like. Um, even, even for some things as simple as where they invite Sammy to something and then she gets there and they realize, Oh, we have no way to get Sammy on the stage. The stage is not accessible at all to her. And so we've had issues like that. Um, even when people invite us to things, I guess another way, uh, to look at it is since we've had Sammy is like we, we take her out in public and this is before raising Dion and before she was like, you know, on a TV show, a lot of people just have trouble accepting that disability is normal and that it's not a result of something terrible that the parent did. We've been just at the grocery store and someone will come up to us and say, what did you do to make your child that way? Or they'll walk up to us and say, you know, if you had more faith, uh, your child wouldn't have to be that way. It's just various um, uh, ignorant things like that where you just, I would have never known that people are so blatantly rude to, you know, parents with kids with disabilities until we had one ourselves. And we just begin to see a lot of that. Um, and then with our, um, our other kids, they've grown uh, to be a lot more inclusive in their thinking, just to, to be way more defensive of, of people that are being picked on or bullied because they're different. Um, there's been instances where, um, you know, Sarah, her older sister has stood up for her in public when they're out at the mall or somewhere. And, uh, you know, we have instances of like teenagers pulling out their phones and discreetly taking pictures of Sammy without asking permission. And this is before raising Dion, um, just doing rude things, just not treating her like a person. And so we just began to see a lot of the, uh, ableism that was kind of invisible to us before because we didn't live in that world and we didn't have to face any of those consequences. And so it was just waking up to, you know, the world wasn't really built to accommodate our daughter and just slowly realizing all the facets of that. And how did you, how have you reacted in the past to these rude incidents when, you know, someone approaches your daughter and mm -hmm. treats her as less than a human being. How did, how did you react to that? Well, I, the people that yell stuff at us, um, normally they're not, you, you think that they're wanting a conversation. And so you try to start explaining, well, actually her condition is genetic and, and they just walk away. They, they just wanted to blame you and move on. They really weren't interested in hearing your story or knowing what the real issue is. Um, one of the things that, um, I saw a lot too early on when she was younger is like if we'd be at a toy store or something and we're just going down the toy aisle and she's in her wheelchair, another kid would see her and just be like, oh, that, they would see that's just another kid. I want to go talk to her. So they walk over and start talking to her. And then the parents would rush in and scoop up and grab their child and take them away to another aisle because it was like, I'm just assuming there was like this fear of, oh, my child hasn't been prepared on how to interact, probably good intentions, thinking my child has not been prepared on how to interact with a child in a wheelchair. I'm so afraid that my little child's going to say something offensive or rude or odd, or, you know, it's going to become an awkward conversation. So I, I would rather just usher them away and not have to deal with that. And so they're without really realizing it, they're teaching their children the way that you treat people with disabilities is, is you just ignore them. You, you don't treat them like people. You don't get to know them. They're, they're so afraid of that awkward conversation of their kids saying something. And we've had kids, you know, that mean well and say things that could be interpreted offensively. And we don't 
uh, you know, bite their head off or anything like that. We just try to kindly talk to them and correct them if we can and, and, uh, move on. But it's, uh, I don't know that we've ever really had anybody that, uh, wants a long conversation like that. They basically, if they're rude, they just want to be rude and move on, you know? So Sammy, how, how has all this impacted you? I mean, are you, are you in pain quite frequently? And, and if so, how do you deal with that pain? Well, when I break something, I am in pain, but otherwise, unless my rods are moving around in there and stuff, then there's no like normal, pains and aches daily or anything like that. Um, unless I just break something, then yeah, I'll have pain. And the way I deal with that pain is, Mom, um, what's that medicine called? It's kind of orangey and it's a medicine for pain. Motrin? Yeah, I, I take Motrin. But if it's a big break, then you need the prescription yeah. Yeah. pain relief. Yeah. Yeah. It tastes bad, but I take it anyway. So maybe we can talk about the process of auditioning. And, and Matt, maybe you can t- tell me about how the audition for Raising uh, Dion came about. Yeah, so Nikki Young over at Morgan's Wonderland, she used to be in casting, and so she knew people at Netflix. And Netflix was looking for someone to fill the role of Esperanza on Raising Dion, and so they reached out to her and said, hey, do you have any kids that go to Morgan's Wonderland? Um, that's a... a park here in San Antonio where it's uh, from the ground up, it's built to be inclusive so that families can come in and uh, every ride you can use your wheelchair to get on the ride. And it's not just for people with disabilities, also for their family members. Um, And so they said, do you know of any girls that you think would be good fit for this role of Esperanza? And she uh, gave them three names. One of them was Sammy. And so uh, at the same time, we got a voicemail saying that they wanted from Morgan's Wonderland saying that they wanted uh, permission to share Sammy's contact information with someone for her to do some work. But the voicemail either cut off or cut short or something. There wasn't really any more information. And we thought we just assumed because Sammy had been in a commercial for Morgan's Wonderland that they were just talking about doing a commercial for something similar and uh, so we kind of just forgot about it and ignored it and just said, well, we don't really know all the details and we're not, you know, super uh, concerned about her being in another commercial necessarily. And then right after that, my wife uh, was in a Facebook group about children with disabilities, had nothing to do with acting. And someone posted in there, hey, they're looking for a wheelchair user, uh, a little girl that's like seven, eight years old. And it said she's supposed to be a no-nonsense, uh, sassy, smart girl who's hilarious and funny. And we, we thought, whoa, that is like Sammy to a T. That, like she's super sassy. She's super sharp-witted. Um, she always speaks her mind. And uh, we thought, wow, that sounds like perfect for Sammy. And then we thought, I wonder if the Morgan's Wonderland thing was related to that, but it seemed crazy, like wild. Like why in the world would they want Sammy to be on a Netflix show? It seems like she'd have to have experience or something. Um, And so we just figured, you know what, let's just go ahead and reply to this casting call and see if Netflix responds. Um, So we emailed Netflix uh, based on the casting call, the email that was attached to that. And they said, yes, we, we do want Sammy to audition for this part. Please, uh, they sent us some scripts. They said, uh, get this back to us as soon as you can. So we spent one day practicing. And that's when we realized, me and my wife kind of realized she may be gifted in acting because she was memorizing her lines extremely quick. Because we'd tell her, uh, we need to go over the lines so you can memorize it. And she'd be like, no, I already have it memorized. And we're like, no, you don't. And she was like, here, take the paper. I don't need the paper. And we'd be like, oh, wow, okay, you memorize those lines, like, super quick, okay. Um, And then we just kind of coached her to just be yourself when you're doing it. Like, they want to see you, what you add to this script. And so we just encouraged her to be her silly self and not try to, like, put on some acting mask. Just be yourself because that's, you know, they're either going to love you or they're not. And so – they loved what they saw and they said, could you please do some more? So they sent us some more scripts and gave us some feedback and some minor things to adjust. And uh, soon after that, they basically told her that she had gotten the part because she was the only 
audition tape that made everybody in the room laugh. And so they just fell in love with her. But she can share the maybe the story of how she heard that news. I'm but, an elephant. What do you, <laughs> I memorize stuff. Oh, she, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know why she just said that. But, yeah, she, she's really good at memorizing. Even when they do changes to the script, and they'll say, okay, for this – for this line, now, instead of saying this, say this. And sometimes, like, I'll be confused as to what they want changed. But she'll know exactly what they're talking about, and she'll just whip it out and say it, you know. And so she's really good at at that, getting her lines. But she does have to practice a lot. Um, she puts in a lot of work. It's definitely a huge blessing, but it's not an easy thing. She puts a lot of work into it, um, even though she makes it look, you know, easy. But she does put a lot of work into it. So, Sammy, tell me about when you first, your reaction when you first heard that you got the part. We were on a road trip to go visit family, and we, in the middle of driving, someone called us. The person who was not driving answered, and they said I got the part. And everyone in the car was screaming and yelling, and we did cut our vacation short, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, we they had to fly out. Uh, to Atlanta to sign the contract almost immediately. So the vacation was cut short. That's okay. Yeah. We vacationed later. So can you um, talk about any special provisions or accommodations that were made by the show to um, for Sammy to participate in, in the production? Yeah. So the first thing um, that we did was I read through all the scripts, me and my wife, and we just found all the things that we thought would – probably troublesome for Sammy. Like they had her picking up a heavy backpack. They had a scene where like within like one scene, there was like three different uh, characters who picked her up and put her into a car seat and then took her out of the car seat. And so we're like, we need to rewrite that because we're just not comfortable with that many strangers picking her up and handling her because they could break her so easily. Um, And they rewrote that part. And then um, there's like a scene where she has to go uh, save Dion by grabbing his inhaler because he has asthma. And she's supposed to like speed across like some gravel. And we just said, well, we're not really comfortable with her going super fast on this type of gravel. Can we like put a pavement in or something? And they changed that and fixed that. There was a lot of little changes like that that they were all open to. So that was the first thing. Um, and the, I guess the second thing is like when we got finally got there and they started filming, um, they move all the actors around um, in these huge vans. And this is just normal for, for every show, whether it's Raising Dion or Stranger Things. They all use the same type of van, but they're like color coded. So, you know, like the red vans are for this show. The white vans are for this show. But these vans have like when you get out of them, they have these very, very tall steps that are not natural. They're just really tall steps. And then when you get into the van... There's these very narrow aisle seats. So we're having to, you know, pick Sammy up and, and hold her and then get into the van. And it was just like right away we're like, this is not safe. We don't feel comfortable doing this because we're going to be doing this hundreds of times over the next couple months. And we don't want an accident to happen. So within two hours, they had a uh, uh, mob- mobility van on set that they gave us to use for the whole duration of the show. And they actually used it in the show. You'll see it in the show. I think it's like episode four or five. Um, the show that dad was in. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, you press a button and the door opens up in the van and a ramp comes out and then she rolls her wheelchair in there and there's tie downs to strap down her wheelchair and a, and a seatbelt. And so, uh, they got that for her within two hours. That was amazing. And then obviously like for her trailer, most trailers don't come with a ramp. Um, they just have stairs, but they added a, a ramp to her trailer for her. And then every time she's shooting, they always like, if she's coming on set or off of set, there's always a lot of people moving around. It's, it's pretty chaotic. And you've got people carrying heavy equipment and background props and different things. And so they always like stop everything and halt everything. And they're, they're like on their walkies. They're like, okay, Sammy's coming through. Everybody halt. Everybody clear a path. And so they make sure she has a clear path for her wheelchair. And nobody's going to be walking around her because we don't want anyone to bump into her and cause a fracture. And so they're, they're super careful with her. Um, they've been super accommodating for everything we've asked and they're always stopping us and saying, Hey, if there's anything, you know, you're uncomfortable with today on the shoot, let us know. They're always, you know, bringing up every situation. So they're, they're being as inclusive and adopting everything as they can. We haven't had any problems. We're really surprised at how much they've embraced Sammy and made everything very safe for her. 
Well, I think we should say that that this is a show where um, for Sammy's role, um, they wanted Raising Dion wanted to cast a young person with a disability. I think it sounds like they really understood what goes into that and, and what accommodations need to be made, even if they are not there at the outset, that they are um, worked in as situations develop, which, which is, which is good. And I wish, I wish more shows, you know, would go in that direction. So Matt, let me ask you um, what reactions did you and your wife receive from people who watched the show? Well, before they watched the show, um, for a long time, we couldn't tell anybody she was on the show. Like we could just say that Sammy is going to be on a Netflix show. And it was kind of strange because we didn't expect for everyone to assume this, but everyone we talked to just assumed, Oh, you mean she's going to be on a reality show or something about her disability? And we're like, no, why would you assume that? Um, and it just, it seemed odd that there's this kind of, expectation that if someone with a disability is going to be on a TV show, then it's going to center around their disability and it can't just be a drama or, you know, a a superhero show or something. Um, And and I guess, you know, because she had not acted before, I guess there is the sense that, oh, well, if you don't have any history of acting, you would probably get into reality TV easier than anything else. But it was just a little bit odd that that's what they all expected. Um, but once everybody, once it came out and everybody saw it, um, they were blown away because she is a natural actor. You know, everyone that knew us is like, wow, I, you know, we knew your daughter was in the show, but we had no idea she was going to be that good. And it's just because she was so natural at it. Um, and then um, after it came out, you know, we, she had uh, a number of people with disabilities that used to be in acting and got out of acting and after seeing her on the show, it kind of renewed their fire to do that. And they said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm getting back into acting because of your role on Raising Dion. And so that's that's super exciting um, for us to hear that because that's one of the things we wanted to do was to allow this to be an opportunity to get people excited to say, hey, uh, I, I have a disability. I can act, too. You know, there's a lot of people that thought that door was just closed to them because they had a disability. And you don't see a lot of uh people on TV shows with disabilities that are authentic. And so we're hoping this, you know, just starts a little something and gets the fire going that Hollywood realizes this and, and actors with disabilities realize this, that, that, you know, it can happen. Yeah. So we've done um, as a foundation, a lot of work in advocating for authentic representation of disability. And, you know, most Mm -hmm. recently NBC universal and CBS Viacom have come on, uh, agreeing to audition uh, actors with disabilities for all roles. But I-, I wanted to ask you and Sammy, do you think it's important that the roles of characters with disabilities be played by actual actors with those disabilities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I-, I do. And what I kind of relate it to when people have trouble understanding why I would believe that is, you know, it back in the day, uh, they used to have all the white actors play all the roles and they would use makeup to make themselves appear like they were another race. And and now that's just, everyone realizes that it was hugely wrong and you, you don't see that happen now. Well, it's also wrong to take a role that should be given to someone with a disability and give it to an able-bodied actor. And I think if you look at a lot of those roles that have been given, um, you just see the details in the script because they, they don't consult people with disabilities to make it authentic. Uh, you see uh, actors in wheelchairs doing things in ways that someone with that condition would never do it. And a large viewership of people do have disabilities and they do recognize these inconsistencies, these ir- irregularities. Um, and it just, I think it makes the story, the story less interesting, less genuine, less authentic. And I I just think it's wrong. I think that that clearly, you know, Sammy has shown that it can be done um, and there's no reason for it not to be done. And so um, I I think it's just a bunch of excuses uh, are given for why they do it. I'll be very, very careful about how I say this. Um, Some people within the industry knew someone working on the show Raising Dion. And I don't know who these people are, so I'm not trying to out anybody or anything like that. Um, But they knew about the role because they knew other people working on the show. 
And they said, you know, their advice to people working on the show was, you're never going to find an eight-year-old girl in a wheelchair who's funny. They don't exist. And so it was like, whoa, you know, to hear that that's what was going, you know, that that's the type of mentality that goes around Hollywood. And the advice was, you need to get an 11 or 12 year old girl. That's and, very ageist and um, able this. Yeah, exactly. You need to get an 11 or 12 year old girl and have them fake being in a wheelchair. Because you're saying that eight mm-hmm. year olds can't be funny and that people who have disabilities can't be funny. And that's very wrong. Yeah. And so that's the type of mindset that Netflix was fighting against. Um, it's very rare that people get roles like Sammy did. I mean, what, what they did and what Carol Barbie, the showrunner, she's the one who created the role of Esperanza. And she's the one that was from the very beginning saying this is going to be an authentically cast role. Um, so they did something very exceptional there. And we want to see that become more common. Well, I do, I do think that there, I mean, if you look at the, last three decades of uh, men that have won the Oscar for best actor, um, half of them have won for playing a disability. So I think that there is this ingrained perception in in the entertainment industry that playing a disability is is good acting. Uh, Whereas what you mentioned, you know, uh, playing a a different race or a different gender or, or even sexual orientation is no longer um, accepted, but, but with disability, you still have that hurdle. Although I do see from our own experiences as activists that more and more studios are coming on board. We're giving out the seal of approval, um, to many, many shows. So, um, there are, um, showrunners who have made it a point of casting authentic uh, authentically. And mm-hmm. I think they're seeing people, you know, like Sammy are great actresses and, 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 uh, the talent pool is out there if you look for it. So Sammy, how has playing, uh, in Raising Dion changed your life? Well, this was, um, before COVID, before we couldn't go out places and stuff. When we were in public, people would come up and say, oh, are you Esperanza from Racing DR? And I was like, yeah. So I'm happy about that because I get to meet a lot of more people. And um, net- this was before um, COVID, may I remind you. Netflix invited me to um, two Netflix parties. One was the Emmy. Yeah. yeah, the Emmys. Mm-hmm. And the other was a Christmas party, and that was super awesome. I got to meet a bunch of people, dance, dance party, and stuff like yeah. that. So, yeah, <laughs> um, it's been awesome. Yeah, it was pretty pretty awesome because we were kind of nervous. Like, we felt – well, I felt out of place. I'm not a star, but Sammy is. But a lot of the celebrities at these parties would come up – and approach Sammy and they already knew who she was and they wanted to talk to her. So we were just impressed with, with that. It was really amazing to see that other actors, Adam Sandler, yeah. uh, David Chappelle, when, all of, you when, know, came up and approached let me tell her. you a funny story. Okay. <laughs> so at the Christmas party, the music was like way too loud. So Adam Sandler came and talked to me, but I f- kept on thinking he said bye. So I said bye too. And I didn't know what he was saying. So I was like, bye. Yeah, she kind of bide him away because she he was saying hi, but he thought she was saying bye or something. I don't know. She ended the conversation accidentally. <laughs> he thought he was saying bye because he had to go or something. And I was saying bye, but I didn't know he was saying something else. So it was very confusing. And if you're listening to this right now, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure he appreciates that. Um Matt, let me ask you a serious question. There's so many examples of child actors whose early success had a major impact on their lives, and it was not always a positive impact. How are you and your wife protecting, you know, Sammy in a way that to prevent, you know, sort of the tragedies that have happened in the past with child actors? Yeah. Uh, well, one thing that we're doing that's not really traditional, uh, a way of doing it is we don't have a manager. We don't have an agent. We do everything ourselves. And so we don't have anyone that's kind of putting pressure on her. Like you need to do this to be, be a bigger star. You need to do that. 
And so we're kind of controlling all of that ourselves. Um, and then as well, um, like when she's on set doing Raising Dion, she's never by herself. Uh, my wife is always there right next to her. I use all of my vacation days uh, since she got on the show to go visit her on set. So, so she doesn't have any uh, other influences that are, you know, coming from Hollywood and trying to push her in certain directions. Um, like we had, for instance, she had a, uh, a major studio, which I won't name, but a, a major studio, one of the big ones, um, wanted her to be, uh, have a star role in a new show coming out. And they sent us a script and we looked at it and it was, there was just every negative stereotype you could associate with a person with a disability was in the script. And uh, it was just right. really full of ableism. And we wrote them back and said, you know, which a manager and agent would never want to want you to, this is not a good move to do, but we, we thought it was the right thing to do. So we sat down and wrote out, here's all the, the things we had issues with in this script and here's how you could revise it or, you know, begin to revise it and give our own suggestions and explain why what was said was hurtful and offensive and uh, we never heard back from them again. But the next time that they sent out a casting call for that very same role, we noticed that they had applied everything we had told them. So they changed all the descriptions. They changed everything about it. Uh, but clearly, you know, we had closed that door by being upfront about it. So we don't have anyone that's um, pressuring her to, to make money or uh, to take whatever role comes her way. Uh, we're not treating this as though we're desperate for her to have more roles or anything. Um, we, we've had a lot of people reach out to us. Uh, and so she has lots of offers that she gets. And if it's not right, we just decline it because we're explaining to her the most important thing that you should do with this opportunity is be a good advocate, be a good representative of the disability community. And so that's what we're putting first in her mind is this is not about you being famous or I you know making money. This is about you having a chance to be a good representative for disability community and to make change and break down walls and break down barriers. And yeah, she, she, she hears me. So. so Sammy, a couple of, a couple of uh, questions I'd like to end with. Um, and then some um, questions from some of your fans. First of all, what's the best part of being an actress for you? Um, well, the best part of being an actress is you know, um, representing people with disabilities and helping get that out there that people with disabilities can be actors and that there should be authentic um, roles for people with disabilities. And that's my favorite part about acting is to help other people. That's very uh, mature of you. So a couple of questions from your fans. This is from Jackson Sanford 24. Do you plan to acting as a career? Well, yes, I do. But I don't know what's going to happen after I get out of college. So um, I'm still probably going to act after I get out of college. But I don't know what I'm going to do after that. But I would like to be in many other TV shows and movies and stuff like that. So I am planning as a, as a career mostly. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but yeah. Uh, here's a question from uh, Lily Y07. Uh, what is your favorite behind the scenes memory of filming Raising Dion? Okay, um, well, I didn't really have that many special facts, but the one that I do remember is the one where, you know how you kind of see me floating up in my chair, out of my chair? Well, actually, the way how that was done was, um, there was no green screen, none of that. I was in, you see my power wheelchair right here? Let me just, I know other people can't see this, but, um, I can rise my wheelchair, So I just rise my wheelchair to its highest point so that it would look like I'm flying out of my chair. So they filmed that and they edit out, edited out the chair. And for the leg scene where it looks like I'm walking, I just moved my legs like I was walking. So that's um, cool. That's how it was cool. done. So one last question from Lurcha Darbell. When can we expect es Esperanza to get her own show? 
Hint, Raising Esperanza. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think that's... I, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Raising Esperanza. But okay. That's the most strangest question I've ever gotten through the years, but okay. I think it's clear that your fans love you and uh, they want to see more of you. And um, I think you're... The fact that you're authentic, uh, not only in portraying disability, but as a person and, and your vivaciousness comes across, I think people love that. I really want to thank you, Sammy and, and Matt, for spending some time with, with me on All Inclusive. And it was a pleasure talking to you. And I wish you a lot of success uh, coming up in the, in, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you guys. Nice, nice meeting you too. All Inclusive is a production of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Our key mission is the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. You can find All Inclusive on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. To view the show notes, transcripts, or to learn more, go to rudermanfoundation.org slash all-inclusive. Have an idea for a podcast? Be sure to tweet at jruderman.